Hey guys, this is Nick and this is your monthly recap of what happened in the Linux, free software and privacy world for June 2019. This video is sponsored by Linode. Linode lets you set up your own server to host a website, set up a VPN, create a Nextcloud instance, host a game server and even more. Linode offers Linux-based configurations. If it runs on Linux, it runs on Linode. They have 24-7 support by phone or support ticket, and pricing starts at $5 and is capped, so you won't get any hidden fees or surprise bills. Sign up with the link in the description below to get a $20 credit to set up your own Linux server using the code LINUXEXP19. June the 4th. Firefox announced they will soon start blocking trackers by default. The option was already available, and you could enable it manually in the browser settings, but this takes it a step further, taking that checkbox by default. The change will probably speed up page loading, since you won't load tracking scripts anymore, and it also means your browsing will be a bit more private by default. I welcome the change, even though I had enabled that feature as soon as it was possible. June the 5th. Crytar 4.2.1 released a few days after the initial 4.2 release, bringing a lot of bug fixes but no new features, which 4.2 was already jam-packed with. The most important fixes seem to be an improvement in performance when using Crytar for a long time, and fixes to the opening saving of files using non-Latin characters. Zorin OS 15 was released as well, and it is a beauty. I already went over most of the stuff in a dedicated video, but the highlights are a completely new look and feel with a nice deep in like theme, a dark mode, and a way to automatically switch between light and dark themes depending on the time of the day, as well as the addition of Zorin Connect, a tool based on KDE Connect. Zorin OS 15 also brings new desktop layouts to change how your desktop works in one click, but they are limited to the Ultimate Edition, as well as Flatpak support. If you're not put off by its older Ubuntu LTS base, you should definitely give it a try. It's probably the best implementation of GNOME 3 I've seen. June 6th. Google released a few more details about Stadia, its game streaming service. It seems that it will offer a free tier, limited to 1080p, and a paid one for $10 a month, which gives access to 4K gameplay and free games now and then. I have mixed feelings about the service, mostly linked to the fact that Google is not a company I want to support more than I already do, and the fact that we don't really know what happens to your games if the service shuts down. A solid internet connection seems mandatory as well, with a minimum of 10 megabits all the way to 35 megabits per second to play in 4K 60fps. Google offers a Founders Edition, which will be the only way to play Stadia until 2020, and it bundles a Stadia controller, a Chromecast, and a 3-month subscription to Stadia Pro, as well as Destiny 2 and all its extensions for $129, which doesn't sound like a bad deal. June 7th. Canon Live 19.04.2 was released, bringing bug fixes all around. Most of you might not care, but it's my daily video editor, and every bug that gets fixed makes my life easier. The main fixes concern the compositing, which could be unreliable depending on which track you put your video or image clips on, the grouping of clips, which could behave weirdly, and the playhead and markers. The Flatpak version is already up to date, so if you use Caden Live, do update, it's worth it. Proton 4.2-6 was released, bringing fixes for the Steam Networking API, a new version of F-Audio, and Controller Rumble support fixes. Its version of DXVK 1.2.1 has also been rebuilt with a newer compiler, which should increase performance, especially on 32-bit games. 9th of June. Firefox might start selling premium subscriptions for additional services to Firefox. The Mozilla Foundation heavily relies on Google for funding at the moment, and they are looking at ways to diversify their revenue, including optional paid-for services in the browser. Apparently, none of what exists already in Firefox will be taken away, only new services like a VPN, for example, will be added and monetized. I am all for it if it can bring Mozilla some independence from Google, but I also hope Firefox won't turn into one big mess of inactive features and ads for services you don't subscribe to. June 10th. LMMS 1.2 released after four years since the last update. For those who don't know, LMMS is a music creation tool allowing you to use samples or direct audio from instruments to create songs. The new version brings a lot of new features, including a brand new theme which makes the app look more modern, a demo song to learn how to use the software, new export encodings for MP3, WAV and OGG, 
and a lot more, which doesn't mean a thing to me since I know about as much as making music as I know about rocket fuel. Wine 4.10 was released, bringing bug fixes, volume adjustment in audio drivers, as well as more plug and play driver support. It is a smaller release without many flashy features, but to be fair, the bi monthly release schedule can bring new stuff every time. 11th of June. KDE Plasma 5.16 was released, and it brings a few nice enhancements. The notification system has been completely rewritten, grouping notifications by application and revamping its settings. The settings panel also have seen a lot of work to make them look and feel more consistent, notably in the appearance section, with the selection of color themes being the major focus. Discover, the package manager, has now a better layout for updates as well. I made a dedicated video on that new release, check it out to see all the details. Mozilla changed its Firefox family logo, and the logos look pretty good. A bit more abstract, perhaps, but still recognizable and a bit more in keeping with the recent icon design trends. It should also integrate better with GNOME's new icons. While the browser logo looks good, the other services don't really look like they belong to the same family with smaller line-based logos. 12th of June. GIMP 2.10.12 has been released and this is mostly a bug fix version after the big 2.10 release. It brings an improved curves tool, a new offset tool, faster painting performance and support for TIFF exporting. Windows users will also benefit from the support of user installed fonts, which is always nice. 14th of June. Valve released a new Steam client, with its headline feature being Steam Remote Play, allowing you to stream games from a Steam client to another, whether they're on the same network or not. Most other fixes and improvements are the same as the ones I mentioned in a previous news video, fixing bugs with the Steam overlay, crashes when starting games, or when moving large files on Linux. Rumble support for controllers should also now be a lot better, or even just work, and more importantly, allowing developers to try specific Proton settings before whitelisting their games. Microsoft said that they would like to bring Microsoft Edge to Linux in a Reddit AMA. Since it's now based on Chromium, there are no roadblocks to port it over, although I don't know many Linux users who would switch to this one except for testing purposes. They say they are still focused on bringing the best experience on Mac and Windows, and then tackling Linux, but since they mentioned an installer and an updater, I'm afraid they'll ship a bloated mess that lives outside of the package manager. We'll have to wait and see. 15th of June. DXVK 1.2.2 was released, and it's a small bug fix version, resolving issues with Planet Coaster, Team Sonic Racing, and Near Automata, as well as a few CPU overhead improvements. Users will probably benefit from this release in a future release of Proton or a Lutris installer. Shotcut, the open source video editor, got a new release, version 19.06. It brings a cleanup from time codes on the timelines, new blur filters, improvements to the main toolbar's appearance, and a bunch of bug fixes and improvements. I haven't gotten around to trying out Shotcut yet, but intend to when I have more time on my hands. This new version is already available through Flathub or the Snap Store, so if that's a tool you use, you should definitely update. Netflix identified a vulnerability in the Linux kernel in the TCP networking stack that could allow a malicious attacker to create a kernel panic remotely. Patches were emerged the next day to fix this issue, so you should definitely upgrade your kernel if your distro offers an update. 18th of June. Ubuntu announced that they would drop all 32-bit support going forward, starting with 19.10 E1Ermine, or however you're supposed to pronounce that. Users on a current 32-bit version of Ubuntu will be able to continue using their system, but won't be able to upgrade to a newer one. It also means that apps that don't provide a 32-bit version won't be able to run on the newer versions, including games from Steam, GOG and the libraries they require. Since then, Valve has announced that Steam would not support Ubuntu anymore, which resulted in backpedaling on Ubuntu's part, announcing they would still build select packages for the 32-bit architecture. This culminated in Valve recommitting to support Ubuntu, but still looking at other distros to avoid such problems in the future. The whole thing could have been a miscommunication, or simply an act of backpedaling in light of the huge backlash they faced over this decision. In the end, Ubuntu will still not be my recommendation for gaming distro, as long as a solution isn't found to provide all 32-bit libraries that might be needed. A critical security flaw has been discovered in Firefox, and has been patched immediately afterwards. 
It used JavaScript to crash the browser, and Mozilla warns that hackers are already exploiting the flaw. You should update Firefox now if an update is available in your repos. June 20th. A new project brings Compiz back, but for Wayland. Wayfire is still in pre-alpha and will probably break your window manager, but it already supports a lot of 3D plugins and effects, workspaces, Wayland and X Wayland windows. Wayfire replicates a basic GNOME shell, so you can't use it for now with another desktop environment or another window manager. June 21st. Wine 4.11 has been released, bringing an updated Mono engine for improved .NET compatibility, the first implementation for enumerating display devices, and a lot of bug fixes, specifically for SWAT 4, Legacy of Kane Soul Reaver, Chromium Embedded Framework, and Max Paint 3. June 25th. Fedora developers announced their roadmap for Fedora Workstation 31, which is due to release in October. Improvements include making sure Wayland does not need any x.org bits to work correctly, and better integration with applications requiring that X server to work, initial development of the core features of Pipewire, a new audio backend, which is meant to replace Jack and Pulse Audio, and better flatpak automation for building flatpaks out of RPMs. The GNOME Classic session will also see some improvements, surprisingly, for users nostalgic of the GNOME 2 experience. The activities overview will be removed, and the workspace switcher will now work better. Other improvements include better fingerprint scanner drivers for Synaptics and support for the new Open H264 2.0 specification, which should enable playing a lot more video files out of the box. June 26th. GNOME has announced some work on the GNOME Usage app, which allows you to look at your system's performance and disk usage. The storage backend has now been rewritten and is a lot faster and nicer to interact with. Users of the Disk Usage and Analyzer, also called Baobab, might want to take a look at this one, since it integrates better with GNOME 3, although it doesn't have as many features right now. Proton 4.2-8 was released, providing fixes for games using an in-game web browser, such as Football Manager 2019, and bringing a new version of Mono for enhanced .NET support. Alt-Tab support should also be more reliable. Since 4.2-8 caused some issues with Mordao, Soul Calibur 4, and other games, Proton 4.2-9 was released the next day. DXVK also saw an update on the same day, fixing bugs on Unreal Engine 4 games, a regression on World of Warships, as well as performance improvements on the CPU side and on lower-end NVIDIA GPUs. June 27th. Mozilla launched a new tool called Track This. It's meant to trick advertisers into thinking your browsing profile is completely different from your regular browsing habits. It offers a few profiles to choose from, from Hype Beast to Influencer. Choosing one of these will open a hundred tabs, so beware if you want to try this and fill your browser with various cookies, tricking advertisers and making them think you're somebody you're not. While it's not meant to be used every day to scramble your profile, it's a handy tool to make users understand how web advertising works and what kind of data can be collected. If you're using Firefox, you'll only open 20 tabs at once, since the browser is better protected against websites that want to spam you. Quant moved their map service out of alpha and into beta. While it still lags behind bigger alternatives like Google Maps in terms of data, it also doesn't track you, the addresses you're looking for, or your itineraries. The OSM-based service is now perfectly usable and I hope they release a mobile app version of it so I can use it from my smartphone, which is probably where most people interact with maps nowadays. Firefox also announced a preview for their new Firefox browser for Android. It will merge Firefox Focus and the regular browser into a new package, and Mozilla says it's twice as fast as the version you can currently download from the Play Store. It also promises to bring the improvements that the Quantum project already brought to the desktop, which is nice. I've been using Firefox on Android for a while now, and my only gripe with it was that it tended to be pretty slow at times. I'll be trying out that preview application and see if it really makes a difference. Microsoft seeks to join the official Linux distros mailing lists, which is the place where all ongoing security issues, vulnerabilities, and patches are discussed. I get the interest, since they will be shipping a Linux kernel for their Windows subsystem for Linux, but still, this makes me uneasy. Today's Microsoft is not the one that treated Linux as a cancer, but their intentions are still unclear about Linux, so giving them access to all that information might backfire at some point. 
We'll have to see how the community handles that one. 29th of June. Google quietly opened their developer website for Fuxia or Fuchsia or whatever you pronounce that thing, their new mobile open source OS. While it's still very early and clearly the documentation is just at its beginning, they clearly state that Fuchsia is not Linux right off the bat. They seem to use their own kernel called Zircon. While Google hasn't announced much around this project, it is understood that it might one day be the replacement to Android or Chrome OS, so it's worth a look. And that's it for this month. If you liked this video, please consider liking, subscribing and turning on notifications. If you really did like it, I have a Patreon page, I'll leave a link in the description. Thank you guys for watching, and I'll see you in the next one. Bye!